in the 70s, it was uh, commonly acknowledged that, I'm quoting, one reproduction in an art magazine is worth two solo exhibitions. This saying expressed the importance of photographic circulation and its main medium, the art magazines. In those years, when mass media was perceived as both utopic and problematic, such a maxim sounded pragmatic and mocking at the same time. To artists and critics who had long debated Walter Benjamin's definition of the exhibition value, the photographic circulation of an artwork revealed its pseudo-democratic effects instead. In contemporary art, where even multiple copies were only affordable for a few owners, the public visibility of an artwork widened its audience and ended up increasing its value. What Benjamin considered to be a democratic feature of technology, that is to say the end of the work of art aurea and its cult value, was actually producing a new form of exclusive value. As philosopher Byung Chul Han observed in a recent reinterpretation of Benjamin, the exhibition value has thus been converted into an actual economic factor. The value of things, he says, only increases when they are actually seen. Visibility thus produces a capital of interests, conceived in the double meaning of the term. On the one hand, it attributes value to the work of art according to the degree of its visibility. And on the other hand, it provides uh, the work with one of the most valuable commodities of our information uh, society, which is to say the audience attention. Well, if observed today, the history of art magazines after 1960 stands out as another episode within the wider process, which affected first mass media, and then social media. Uh, that is to say, the need of planning content for an audience according to the principles of agenda setting and the emergence of the attention economy aimed at inducing a greater cognitive focus in its consumers. This uh, communicative mechanism emerged slowly within art magazines and became stronger, paradoxically, after 1968, with the so-called dematerialization of art. At a time when art became more and more immaterial and multipliable, photographic circulation among magazines was a good way to reactivate some sort of uh, fetishization of the work of art and to compensate somewhat, compensate somewhat for its material inconsistency. Its circulation guaranteed a capital of interest, also, also developed through very various ostensive mediations, from the exhibitions to article in magazines. In Italy, for example, magazines replaced institutions, lacking a form of museum validation comparable to that offered by Germany, for example. One has to think that. Uh, contemporary museums first opened in, in Italy only in the 80s, magazines were one of the few tools of internationalization for Italian art. They contributed a great deal to the reputation of artists, regulating their visibility. Starting with uh, periodicals such as Metro, founded by Bruno Alfieri, who was in contact with a powerful Italian-American gallerist, Leo Castelli, a decisive metamorphosis took place. Art magazines uh, ceases being uh, arenas for the debate among critics and started instead to ground their mediation upon uh, the selectivity implicit in their topics, with the result of generating uh, indicators of the prestige of given artists, such as the significance of the spaces dedicated to them. In this way, magazines actively contributed to the public recognition of an artwork and prompted uh, provisional evaluations 
of its possible uh, commercial worth or future musicalization. Magazines not only validated the work of art on the market, but they could also increase its value through visibility. After 1960, the history of Italian magazines can be reconstructed upon the progressive consciousness they achieved about these new communicative strategies. Starting with Medro, as I said, and going through the attempts of refusing the interference of advertisement perpetrated by magazines such as Beat or NAC in 1968, up to the ability of exploiting such mechanism by Fleshart. In order to fully understand the reputational influence of art magazines, it is worth considering two aspects. First of all, in the post-war period, despite the huge development of mass media, information on contemporary art was monopolized by specialized magazines. And secondly, specialized magazines had no interest in widening their audience or their distribution too much because it proved more effective to address an international art community rather than a mass uh, audience. Italian magazines, especially those belonging to the neo-avant-garde, show very well this networking approach. Their circulation reached, in the best case, 5,000 copies, but distribution still reached the most strategic Western countries and not only, soon requiring English uh, translations. And in 1976, international distributors, one in particular, uh, Idea Books, started to distribute art reviews such as Data, Flash Art, Art Forum, and Studio International to a global elite. To sustain expenses, uh, Magazines resorted mainly to advertising sales, since increasing the price of the magazine would have penalized foreign readers who were already paying a higher price. In this respect, Italy was peculiar because it mainly relied on the support of private art galleries and almost no luxury industry or museum institution. As highlighted by Alexander Albero in his book on conceptual art and advertisement, at that time in the United States, many companies had started investing in contemporary art, finding a symbolical ally in it. In Italy, on the contrary, magazines had uns unsuccessfully tried to free themselves from advertising. Beat, a rebel and hippie magazine, had to capitulate after a few issues in order to, I'm quoting, enrich the number of pages and reproduction. End quote. And sober uh, magazines such as NAC, after years without advertisements, finally trusted a single private sponsor. However, the prevalence of private galleries advertising as a form of support was an international matter, especially for neo avant garde magazines. Our forum, for example, dedicated 40% of its printed pages to advertisements in the 70s. The more general issue was that magazines operated within a, a circle that was equally virtuous and effective. If, on the one hand, magazines could boast an international reputation, the support they received for, from private actors, such as art galleries in particular, could be a form of interference on their critical independence. What periodicals uh, must keep in the face of economic expenses was a delicate balance between their selective reliability and the demand for visibility they received from private galleries. How was it possible so to balance authority and profit? What were the strategy to avoid the culture industry logic? within an elitist and global community such as that of contemporary art, neither the appeal of ostentation luxury nor the resonance of mass media would prove effective. At the beginning of the 70s, for example, German critic Willy Bongard started highlighting the peculiarities of the contemporary art market. 
East Kunst Compass was an annual ranking of the artists based not only on their quotations, but also upon reputational criteria. For the first time, Bongard pointed out the economic value of visibility, relating it to circulation in a precise way. Obviously, not every exhibition or magazine contributed to the increase of the artist's reputation. Kunst Compass, rather, showed how circulation needed to look more like a form of circularity in order to convert itself into visibility. As a matter of fact, its ranking produced a self-consolidating judgment. The ranking of the artists as the result of the points given by experts, which institution, exhibition, or publication, also validated the artist's results in the eyes of those experts. What I mean is that circulation was not itself a positive value in contemporary art, which aimed at distinguish itself from the cultural industry. Such an environment, rather, needed circularity, that is a circulation filtered by selective and self-consolidating criteria. Only in this way could circularity further evolve into visibility, what I would define as the combination of the evidence and relevance of a message, of its distribution, and the capital of even interest that it can produce, and which Bongard empirically helped us to capture. Therefore, magazines played a fundamental role in transforming circulation into circularity, and Italian periodicals contributed in various ways to this process. There is only time to recall a few examples here today. The first one is the refined strategy of community building. Art reviews had to create their audience with the help of galleries who were not only their advertisers, but who also held a role in the distribution of the same magazines. When consulting the archive belonging to Leo Castelli at the Smithsonian in Washington, this phenomenon can be clearly observed together with its geopolitical effects. Bruno Alfieri, director of Metro, maintained a long correspondence with the galleries during the 60s, promoting his artists in Europe and trying to provide exhibitions for Italian artists in return. In 1972-73, flesh art director Giancarlo Poriti suggested to Castelli the idea of a magazine based solely on a few Western advertisers. Castelli himself, of course, Sperone, Fischer, Sonnaven, Lambert, Lattico, and a few others. Politi, however, was able to introduce more up-to-date forms of community building. In 1975, he launched two enterprises. The Art Diary, a guide to more than 3,000 addresses of world insider, insider, sorry, of contemporary art, and an official T-shirt line designed by Ferrucci. Politi thus offered connections that mixed a professional attitude with a more informal management of social relations. That same year, Flesh Art published a two-page column dedicated to portraits of artists, critics, and gallerists, photographed at, at social events or at work. The aim of uh, these photographs uh, was clearly that of co-optation. A few issues uh, later, these portraits also appeared on subscription uh, cards of the uh, uh, magazine Flesh Art. In this way, the magazine fulfilled a function that was parallel to that of its network, contributing to the designation of a qualified community of operators, which one could access thanks to the visibility of its pages. Flesh Art's uh, contributed to creating cohesion among an international group of actors who found there a means of synergy and mutual acknowledgement. This aspect generated a further form of circularity, so to speak. In such a selective community, 
there was a risk to uh, that, uh, let's say, the few advertisers, the private galleries, namely, could strongly influence the criteria of newsworthiness adopted by the magazines they were partly financing, undermining its impartiality and reputation. However, a statistical test on this point, inspired by Bongar's method, reveals more complex uh, facts. First of all, it is necessary to distinguish between a direct visibility and an indirect form of visibility. The former corresponds to all the news explicitly alluding to the activities of a gallery, exhibitions, reviews, for example. The latter is based instead on the visual and textual relevance given to artists exhibited by the galleries. For example, size and quality of photographic reproductions, critical essays uh, of their works, and so on. Once a score has been given to each element, it would be possible to relate it to the advertising investment of a gallery. Advertising fares were easy to calculate, mainly based upon the size of the space, one page, half a page, etc. We can apply this analysis to data. A magazine whose authority it could be considered high and was director Tommaso Trini was an internationally acclaimed critic. The results give good example of the relationship between visibility and advertisement. The table here illustrates the range created between two, the two advertisers, uh, some of the two uh, of, of the advertisers or in the magazine. Our gallery Sperone and our gallery Il Naviglio, showing a similar uh, advertising investment, but a different, as you can see, uh, direct visibility. The advertising space being equal, this displacement in favor of Sperone become, becomes more, even more evident when considering indirect visibility. This demonstrated uh, the delicate attempt of data to combine critical autonomy and advertising funding. Trini, Trini was in fact a critic who showed evident predilection uh, for Arte Povera. Here you can see a ranking of the artist direct visibility on data with some names, uh, big names of Arte Povera. And this predilection partly explains the displacement of these tables, where the galleries that exhibited at the povera, such as Perone, Toselli, Lambert, Stein, received more visibility in comparison to their investment in advertising. On the other end, when gallery advertising was absent, as in the case of NAC, the visibility of artists flattened. An artist very much prolific and active in Italy, such as Valeriano Trubiani, was granted the same space, space as Giulio Paolini, who boasted an international career and was very prominent in magazines such as Data, you can see uh, with his score on Data. We can infer how, for a gallerist, the most effective strategy was not to invest massively in advertising promotion but rather to engage with a community of similar, possibly international actors, through the choice of artists to represent and places to be present. Well, since not every gallery could converge on Arte Povera, this strategy required a certain degree of flexibility. Data, for example, adopted a, a strong turnover policy for the advertisers in order to get funding. Approximately one third of the advertisers um, only paid for a single advertisement and then stopped investing in such a strongly oriented information channel. This means something else too. The authority of a magazine did not depend on its ability to host debates or inflame polemics, but on its implicit assertiveness. Magazines that proved to be too pluralistic such as NAC, soon failed before the ability of data or flash art to filter the visibility of our galleries. 
favoring the audience selective recognition of the artists and orienting the taste of the community. All of the above implied a third aspect of this circularity. Often gallerists did not aim at widening the circle of their collectors by means of advertisement, but aimed at consolidating their own reputation with an already existing audience, which was thus reassured by the gallery's visibility and by its advertising initiative. Before being an act of persuasion, one gallery's advertising was an act of participation a way to be professionally a knowledge within a community. This mechanism favored communicative strategies that were subliminal. To promote his brand, for example, Liu Castelli wisely exploited the birth of the environments and installations in the, in the 60s to spread his name in the credit lines of Italian magazines. You can find uh, an example. Moreover, there were other methods of the dissimulating the act of advertising. The international gallerist Gianenzo Sperone used uh, advertisement to commemorate members of this ideal community, such as Gary Schum, or to mock the table tennis diplomacy of conservative Nixon with the implicit accord of his readers. The act of advertising thus became a gesture of intellectual complicity, belonging to a community which considers any attempt at persuasion vulgar. First of all, because advertising came from the techniques of culture industry, whereas uh, the, co the contemporary art audience consider itself to be immune to them. Secondly, because it would have been pleonastic to do so to a reader who, by buying a selective and activist magazine, had already manifested a precise will of social distinction. These strategies of circularity and visibility thus warded off the danger of visual oversaturation which is implied by circulation in such a highly interconnected and mediatized society such as ours. Work of art can't be promoted with the same prosaic insistence used with goods. A good artist instead wouldn't need commercials, just the aesthetic validation of critics, magazines, and institutions. In order not to publicly affect the reputation of these uh, validators, a gallerist had to invest in indirect visibility, showing off its disinterested and liberal support to such organs of validation. When, eventually, his or her selection of artists came to represent a solid canon within a given community, also built thanks to magazines, then power relations could be inverted, leading galleries <clears throat> to the acquisition of, uh, of an autonomous validating power. Once more, circulation is turning into circularity and visibility into value. Thank you.